Welcome everyone to another seminar on mathematics and high energy physics at Physics Latin. Today we have the pleasure of having Alexander Tomasiello. He's professor of physics at the Universidad of Milano Bicocca. He has held various positions at Harvard University, Stanford University, and Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. During his early stage in his career, he's author of a book called Geometry of String Compactifications. Our students are very familiar with this book since we use it a lot for our course in geometry and topology and physics. Um, his research applied modern mathematical techniques to problems in string theory and modern high energy physics. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Daniel, for the kind invitation to, um, to give this lecture. So the um, and thank you for the kind words. I, um, today I'm not going to talk about my research, but uh, really about the basics of uh, toric geometry. So this is a topic uh, with uh, lots of applications to modern um, theoretical physics, but we will see this only towards the end. I will really focus on the math of the uh, topic, uh, hopefully getting everything in place, but. Uh, uh, you know, please um, tell me, I'm not totally familiar with the level of the other lectures, so uh, please tell me if I'm going too slow or too fast and I can, uh, you know, um, uh, adapt, uh, hopefully on the fly. Um, so the material I have um, uh, prepared today, uh, well, let's say there will be a very short int introduction of, uh, uh, you know, intuitive nature. and. Then we'll uh, um, we'll uh, see one first point of view on the on the uh, on the topic. I, there are several. This is a topic that you can view from several points of view, and the uh, way I like uh, start my video. Can you see me? Yes. Uh, yeah, I received a, a warning that my video had stopped. The way I like um, the uh, the person likes a different um, uh, way of thinking about it, but I, the way that I find more, most intuitive uh, is the one uh, by which I will start, which is uh, um, by using polyhedra. We'll see what this means. Of course, this is the higher dimensional uh, generalization of a polygon. And uh, what um, what's nice about the torque geometry is that it's a, a set of uh, uh, spaces for which there is a very natural uh, correspondence with polyhedra. And this is the point of view from which I will start. Uh, the, uh, but then there are um, various other uh, points of view. The other, uh, another um, very popular one is as uh, Toric quotients. I'm really sorry, sometimes this happens. I, uh, I still don't know why. And um, this will uh, give us a second point of view. Really, there's a third point of view, but I, uh, I will uh, also put it together uh, with this uh, first one. Uh, then we will uh, give um, an application, so, which is um, so an important application, which is to the studies of a certain type of singularities. Um, what this means is that uh, so singularities are points at which uh, the curvature of space is uh, infinite, so, from a point of view of a physicist anyway. Mathematicians have a different perspective. We will see um, more or less uh, what this is, but the, um, you might wonder why this, uh, why consider this uh, uh, as an application, because after all, uh, it's still a mathematical topic, and why do we care about singularities? Well, uh, I will try to convince you um, that uh, indeed this uh, leads to interesting applications, because that would be a last section that I, let me just call applications. 
um, where we really tell you about the uh, physics, uh, um, how we use all this uh, machinery in physics. I have to say this last uh, part will be, because um, since I, I think this is a, a lot of material for two hours, this last part will be uh, more qualitative. Uh, it could be made uh, more quantitative, but uh, for now, uh, I think by the time we are here, we will be tired already and we will um, just enjoy um, uh, more qualitative uh, discussion. Like I said, I can adapt it to your taste, uh, but let's start like this. So um, how about the introduction then? The, oh, first of all, perhaps uh, the, it is more traditional to start with um, the, by uh, suggesting some material. Um, I should have done so because, even before uh, giving this outline. So the, of course, I, um, given that I'm the author, I will um, <laughs> uh, follow a bit um, my book on the topic. I don't want to, um, you know, to advertise it too much in the sense that uh, it is not necessary to, to really have it or to uh, download it from the, <laughs> from the, um, from the net. Um, I, these lectures uh, hopefully will be uh, self-contained. Uh, and given that I wrote the book, well, I'm, I'm not going to follow it uh, really word, word by word. I will uh, uh, change the order a little bit, but of course the spirit uh, is going to be similar because after all, um, the, the author of the book and, uh, and the person who gives the lectures are the, the same person. But the, um, uh, I think uh, Daniel, when we were discussing about uh, uh, this also, uh, this, mentioned uh, another source with that, which I think is very uh, nice, uh, which is the, um, the book uh, Mirror Symmetry uh, with uh, many authors, which is um, uh, all discussion about various ideas um, uh, coming into Mirror Symmetry. And there is a, a chapter which is dedicated uh, to Mirror Symmetry. Uh, there are, however, uh, some also some reviews that are more focused on uh, um, on uh, uh, the physics applications. And uh, for example, uh, there is one by, um, by Cyril Closset uh, that I find very nice, but it, it is perhaps um, um, a good review, um, especially uh, regarding the last part, uh, the applications. Um, so for now, we we'll refrain from giving the detailed, uh, uh, from writing down the detailed uh, um, details of uh, all these reviews. But if you can, uh, please feel free to write to me uh, for references, but also for any questions you might have. Um, and my address, I'm sure you can Google it, but. Uh, Oh, damn it. Okay. Once again, feel free to uh, write to me for anything. Okay, uh, well, especially related to this lecture, but uh, why not also? Whatever questions of other natures you might have. Okay, so now let's get into the topic. The, uh, in the introduction, I just want to give you, the introduction is very short. I just want to give you some uh, informal uh, definition. So, uh, well, this is really, even formal, but uh, we will soon get informal. So a toric uh, manifold uh, is um, a manifold whose dimension, first of all, I need it to be even. Uh, really, these will be, uh, these spaces have uh, lots of uh, nice features that we will uh, mention later, uh, but uh, 
um, so for example, they, they, they are complex spaces, there are example complex spaces, scalar spaces, and uh, sometimes even Calabiao, as we will see. And um, I will not focus too much on, on, on these aspects because I think we, they will be covered uh, by other lectures. But uh, for this reason, uh, we need the dimension to be, um, to be even. Um, and uh, main, uh, the main property, the property that defines a target manifold, is that it has a dense open uh, subset isomorphic to C star to the N. C star is, of course, C minus the origin. So by this, you see why I need the dimension to be even. Um, and also you kind of see why uh, it has these properties of being uh, complex uh, and killer because it inherits uh, these properties from from the fact that it contains this uh, copy of, uh, of um, C star to the N. Now, so what does this mean, dense open subset? It means that it's uh, the, almost the whole space. C star to the N is almost the whole space. So you need to just put some more stuff and you will make the uh, whole manifold. But the other things that you need to add are small. Uh, they are of uh, uh, smaller co-dimension. So they're, uh, they will be of uh, smaller dimension, sorry. So this also has to do with the uh, property that I mentioned that uh, uh, these spaces have to do with polyhedral. Why? Well, um, the idea is that you, uh, you uh, remember, you try to uh, build a sketch of uh, what are the pieces you need to glue to this, uh, what are the, a smaller dimensional spaces you need to glue to this C star to the N in order to make it into the whole space that you want to discuss. Uh, just stupidly, the, uh, we can start from N equals one. And um, I'm sorry, but our first example will be just, uh, well, I could really C star itself would also be a toric space because in that case it is not just almost the whole space but uh, the whole space really but uh, a more or less <laughs> trivial case is c because of course c star uh, is c minus a point so if you add the point back in uh, then you have um, the whole space and there is a way to to summarize this, you start with a line, a half line, let's say, uh, not a whole uh, copy of R, but uh, uh, R, uh, the positive copy of R. So this keeps going. And you add a point. So this would be, in this case, uh, a very silly case, um, a diagram that uh, summarizes our space. We have uh, a co the copy of C star, which is associated to this line. And here the point. Uh, this is not very interesting, perhaps. Uh, but you could have uh, some other cases. So in um, complex geometry, sometimes you, um, I'm not in complex geometry, even uh, just in the study of uh, functions, of holomorphic functions, sometimes I switch to, a, I have now switched to a, a network that required the password, and blah, 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 it should be, uh, maybe, maybe before I was on Eddie Rome, usually it's good, but uh, now I have uh, gone to 
more private one. So it should be better. Sorry about that, courtesy of the department. Uh, okay. So where were we? I was telling you that this was just an informal discussion about how to, um, what the essentially uh, uh, toric uh, spaces. So I was saying that it, it consists of, uh, um, so it's basically uh, such that a copy of C star, of N, C star to the N is almost the whole space. So it's closure is the whole thing. And uh, then you build uh, diagrams to help you keep track of what you need to add uh, so that you do get the whole thing. So I give, gave a stupid example like that, but if you keep going, you could um, consider C2, for example. And here I would just draw something like this, where you would take a, a a uh, quarter uh, uh, space, a quarter of uh, R2, and that represents C star squared. And then you, this is another copy of C star, this is another copy of C star, and this is a point that represents the origin of C2. So um, basically here, what you're doing in this simple example is that you're uh, representing, you're drawing uh, only the real parts of the compass coordinates. This is uh, in essence, what you're trying to do also with more complicated examples, almost. Uh, in order to provide for uh, some more interesting examples, we now try to, um, to think about, uh, um, for example, compact uh, spaces. So even for n equals one, there is something we can do. If you think about the, by the way, can you hear me better now? Yeah, now it's fine. It's fine, I agree. So when you uh, study holomorphic functions in uh, um, the complex plane, sometimes you find it useful to uh, think about what happens at infinity. So that, what that means is that you add a single point uh, to see the, uh, that is, represents the, all the asymptotic behaviors. So all the, uh, in whatever direction you go in C and if you keep going um, uh, for an infinite amount of time, you uh, get back to the same uh, point. But this is usually visualized as uh, some kind of sphere because the, the, uh, the point at infinity uh, you can glue it uh, to the uh, to your plane in such a way that it uh, becomes a sphere. This is called the Riemann sphere. Maybe um, sure many of you will have encountered it already. And in that case, uh, so you would add to C star uh, not just a point. But another point, which is the point at infinity. So this will be C star union with the origin, union with this point at infinity. And again, this is called the Riemann sphere. And this is our first example of a compact a toric space. Um, okay, so uh, now, how about other compact examples? Remember that this is still a bit of an informal discussion, will uh, become uh, more formal uh, in a second. So in order to produce uh, more interesting compact examples uh, beyond this uh, one dimensional space, one complex dimensional space, I remind you, of the definition of uh, complex uh, projective space.
So this is the, um, informally we can think of it as the space of lines. What do I mean by that? So if we did this, uh, if we did this in real space, uh, for example, the projective uh, space in um, real uh, real terms uh, would be the space of all possible lines that go to the origin. And uh, if you did that uh, starting from R3, the space of possible lines is almost like a sphere, it's almost like a, uh, the S2. The reason it is not quite the same is that the line that goes in this direction is, uh, if you consider the full line and not just the half line, is also the same as the line that goes in that direction. So uh, instead of having a sphere, you also have a sphere with two opposite points identified. This would be a, comp a real quadratic space. The complex analog is uh, less uh, easy to visualize, uh, but uh, the idea is very similar. So you consider all points except for the origin. The zero underlined means zero, 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 zero. So the, uh, the origin of Cn plus one. And then you divide it out by C star. What does this mean? So you consider, uh, in other words, the n plus one uh, tuples of uh, so, uh, sequences of uh, n plus one numbers. But uh, you also say that they are identified in this fashion. So you uh, take, this would be just uh, the uh, set of such numbers would be C to the n plus one. But now you say, oh, I consider two uh, such uh, uh, points in C n plus one as equivalent if they are related. This is Z1, Z2, and so on. If they are related by rescaling that is of course this doesn't make sense. Would it make sense if we allowed um, the origin in, uh, in this uh, identification? Because the, then well every point would be equal to every other point, uh, would be an too strong an identification. So we uh, we take then um, so the, this is just like saying I have a vector in Cn. And I consider it to be the same as uh, the vector that is twice as long or half as long and so on. In this sense, I am representing a line in Cn plus one. And this lambda needs to be in C star. It is in this sense that I wrote here, uh, quotient, the quotient by C star. Okay, so uh, what the heck is this space? Um, if we, Consider n equals one, so CP one. This would be uh, what? Uh, well, we have we can cover this uh, space with two open sets. If Uh, remember what uh, uh, manifold is. You, it's a space that you can uh, build by gluing uh, several copies of uh, um, of uh, open sets in, in Rn. In this case, the open sets are just uh, copies of uh, C uh, to D one with R two. Uh, why? I can consider first the open set that consists of all the points for which Z naught is different from zero. In other words, well, what happens for these points? Uh, well, by rescaling, well, consider here uh, Z naught and then Z one. 
well, if Z dot, uh, so I can rescale by using a lambda and I can take the lambda equal to one over Z naught because after all, Z naught is uh, non-zero. So I can consider one over Z naught. And if I do this rescaling, uh, I can always take Z naught to be equal to one. So this first open set, you see that it's the same as Z, uh, as a copy of C, because Z can be any complex number. This is the first. Open set. And then there will be another. where you do the same, but with the second coordinate. So if the second coordinate Z1 is non-zero, then you can set it to one. And so you have a second copy of C. Now, of course, uh, most of these points are not um, independent because if uh, both Z0 and Z1 are non-zero, then you can relate this to Berry scaling. So on the intersection, uh, you have that the one Z, well, using Z tilde as a lambda, I see that in order to identify this with one, I will have that uh, Z tilde is one over Z. So I have glued two copies of C by saying that Z the one is one over Z of the other uh, copies. Okay, sorry if uh, this was uh, uh, very clear to you, but uh, clearly now this uh, can be considered as, uh, so together this gives something that is, if you think about it, it's uh, just the same topologically as our S2 that we considered earlier. If we consider the n equals two case, we can do, a, we can have a similar story uh, where in uh, U0, we'll have Coordinate and first set of coordinates, and this time, since I don't want to use uh, to use too many tildes, I can I'll call this z1 and z2 zero. So, with respect to the original, uh, these are uh, um, you should imagine that these are capital. I can see that this is not too clear. Um, on this blackboard, but uh, these are called the homogeneous coordinates and they are capitalized, whereas this uh, imagine as them, uh, them as being small. So by taking, if you start from uh, Z0, capital Z0, Z1, Z2, then uh, to put them in this form, you need to take lambda uh, equal to Z naught uh, to the minus one. You take this and you multiply by lambda uh, that is one over Z naught, so that you, uh, this is uh, turned into one. But then this means that the Z one zero will be Z one capital Z one over capital Z naught. And this is a two zero. Uh, I swear this will not go on forever, but I need these as, a, as examples. So now you uh, have another possibility, which is the chart Q1, on which you have 
Z1, let me call it one relative to the second open set. One, Z2. And then Z2, uh, sorry, Z1, one. one will be uh, Z naught over Z1. Basically, you divide by the one which is non-zero. That's the rule. These are the coordinates in copies of C. So the, uh, before these were isomorphic to copies of uh, uh, C, and these are now, sorry, copies of C2. And there will be an, a U2, uh, but uh, you can work out uh, what this will look like. So now you have to, uh, you have to put together three charts. And Tori geometry gives a way gives you a way to put them together in a nice fashion. By uh, it tells you how to put them together visually. In this case, you see uh, we started from. Uh, C that was non compact. And uh, we give up. So we added the point at infinity to make it compact. Now you can imagine starting from C2, which is one of our uh, charts here. But then you have to somehow accommodate the other charts. And well, uh, there are two more that you have to put together. So you have to put together. So before you have uh, one copy of this half line and you somehow put it together with another copy and they make a segment. Now you have, you have to put together three copies of this. It will become a triangle. This represents the origin of this chart where these two are zero. This represents the origin of this other chart, so the point where these two are zero. And this represents the, the origin of the U2 chart. So this is uh, uh, the first informal idea of how you build uh, toric space. And this is our uh, polyhedron. The, of course, I haven't really given you the rules, and let me now give you, give you the rules. This is called more specifically a uh, toric polyhedron, of course. So, the toric polyhedron is uh, a polyhedron that, uh, to which you associate a space, a complex space, um, in a certain way. How? So, uh, so far, I, I introduced this polyhedron just uh, by moving my hands up <laughs> around. But uh, now I want to give you the formal way of uh, giving a polyhedron producing a space. Uh, here, for, uh, it wasn't clear that the shape of this, uh, I told you that uh, you put together the three open sets in this uh, compact space, uh, but I didn't quite tell you what shape. Uh, so is this triangle, uh, for example, equilateral or rectangle? Well, the, now we will need the precise shape of the space. So the rules are this, you draw, your so I will illustrate the general procedure. It will be uh, possible to give a formal procedure with uh, lots of in um, full generality, but I want to illustrate the procedure exactly with the CP2 example that we just uh, looked at. So what do you do? 
you associate a chart and this is just a shorthand for uh, an open set okay so in our case there will be uh, just isomorphic two copies of uh, uh, c2 and um, so i told you before that to, uh, to each vertex you associate a point but uh, now to each point, I also will associate a chart, the full open set that has that point as an origin. And now you also. Uh, draw all the vectors uh, basis of vectors that uh, start from that uh, from that vertex of the poly, uh, uh, polyhedron along the sides so let me see i call these uh, v10 v20 And this V one two V two two. Uh, similarly, there will be uh, two vectors associated with this vertex. Uh, let me not write also those names because um, the drawing is complicated as it is. Sorry, this. Why did I call them two? Let's call them one. So, So these are the basis of vectors along the sides. And now the since we are well, these are two vectors. This is the basis, this is another basis in R2. So there will be a change of basis from one to the other. So the linear relations give you a way to uh, read off the transition functions. What are the transition functions? Well, sorry, we saw them here. This this was the transition function for for CP one. Um, we had two copies of uh, C with the coordinate C uh, Z and Z tilde, and well, they are glued by this identification Z on uh, the point with Z on one. Uh, uh, on our open set uh, is identified with the point with uh, one over z tilde on the other open set. So you take these two copies of C and you glue them in this way and you obtain a sphere. That was the idea. Here, uh, we didn't work them out. Uh, there are three uh, transition functions because it, uh, they, they are the ones that uh, go to, from u0 to u1, to, from u0 to u2, from u1 to u2. Let me just work out the ones for they go from here to here, from U1 to U0. Well, you see that Z1, one, one is one over Z1, zero. Z2, 
two is what? It is Z two zero. Uh, but almost, um, so we have to divide by this. Divided by Z one zero. So these are the transition. One, this is one of the transition functions. So the transition function uh, is already plural, maybe, but uh, gives you uh, it's a set of uh, transformations, one set of coordinates to to another. How is this summarized by this diagram? Well, you see, if I work out the relations between these two, I see that V one one is minus V one zero and V two one is V two zero. So uh, this was easy. The, the first that I wrote is easy because they point in just in opposite directions. Uh, this one is this uh, minus this. So because if I sum the one that goes up, I will get a purely horizontal uh, vector. So if I formally associate to um, the, if I consider formally an exponential and I take the the exponential of uh, uh, of these relations I will uh, I will exactly obtain these two because they here I will have e to um, that uh, one so when I, when I take the exponential, this uh, being one uh, minus the other would be one uh, being the opposite, the reciprocal of, uh, of the other. And the same, so here, this plus and this minus sign will uh, translate in the fact that this guy is in the numerator and this is in the denominator. So this is the formal way that the, the, this polyhedron summarizes the properties of, uh, of the space. And this is the uh, the full idea, uh, really, of uh, a toric space. The toric space is one that is summarized by this set of rules by a polyhedron. Okay, I kept saying polyhedron here, but the, even though this is a polygon, we have a, a two-dimensional one, but uh, uh, you could keep going to higher dimensions. Uh, so there are many more examples. So for, okay, for example, let's say you want to uh, build the CP3 now. The polyhedron will have dimension uh, three. And there will be a tetrahedron. So the base is still a triangle. But now, um, I need to do it better. So here are the axis. Take as a base, uh, of this theta hidden a rectangle, uh, a triangle uh, with the 90 degree angle as we had before. And now build another side of the same height.
and you will obtain this tetrahedron, this uh, pyramid with a triangular shape. You can keep going and then it can go to dimension whatever, and if uh, it's clear that they um, more or less how to build the high dimensional polyhedron um, associated to such a space. Now notice that the here um, I said that the, the shape of the polyhedron is important, but um, so really, if you make a, so that since the what is really important in this definition, so once you give the transition function, the space is defined. So because I, I give you several copies of uh, uh, C to the n and they tell you how to glue them together, I have uh, given you a space. But um, then all that uh, we really care about is are these linear relations, uh, such as in this example, among the vectors spanning uh, the sides of uh, around one vertex with the vectors uh, spanning the sides around another vertex. I give you those, uh, the space is done, but then, uh, results from this that if you take, if you imagine that this uh, space is drawn in a, well, like, like um, here in a, um, in a grid, like on this uh, sheet of paper, and you apply an uh, a GL2, an SL2Z transformation, in this case SL2Z, or otherwise SLNZ, uh, then they maybe the the polyhedron will get uh, distorted a bit, but the linear relations will stay the same. So for this reason, sometimes it might happen to you that you see two polyhedra, they look the same, but really correspond to the same geometry. And uh, an example, is this. So we consider CP1 and CP1. What is this? Well, we saw that CP1, a single copy, is associated to um, a segment. So what is going to be the product of two CP1s? Well, it's going to be the product of two segments, also known as a square. Sorry, I realized that uh, better squares, but uh, okay. But on the other hand, if you um, if you apply what I just said, that you can associate elements, uh, you can act on this with the elements of SL to Z, and nothing changes really. So you discover that even if you do something like this, um, like a rhombus, like this. It's still okay. It is still it will still correspond to CP1 and CP1. Of course, uh, normally you would write uh, square, but uh, there are uh, some cases where the, it is less obvious that the, there's one that is uh, one choice of polyhedron that is better than another. So. Um, I want to produce more examples before I go to my second point of view. The second point of view is also very nice. I mean, I've, um, I prefer this polyhedron point of view, but uh, um, there is the second point of view is also useful in many contexts, and it is the the one of uh, uh, quotients. But uh, before. Um, we do that. I, uh, I want to also give you an alternative way of thinking about this point of view, which uh, perhaps I should have uh, given immediately, but okay, one thing at a time. So I told you that uh, the CP1 is the same thing as, as a sphere, and I told you that I have to imagine two copies of C, and so 
remember maybe I can draw this I had uh, my first copy of C and my second copy of C which was U1 And then I basically, I had this gluing law that uh, connects a point here to a point here. And uh, so if you take care of all of these, they, a point that is very uh, high up here, very with a very large Z will be connected to one that is very small and so on. So it turns out that it's the same as having a sphere. It's uh, difficult to draw this, but uh, with your hands, it's uh, really easy to understand. But there is an even better way to visualize this, which is which is very common, uh, commonly used, which is that the uh, the um, Polyhedron, the whole space can be imagined as uh, one says a uh, vibration over, sorry, the space can be imagined as a vibration, one says, over the uh, polyhedron. What that means is that there is a map my space M to the polyhedron P. And the, uh, the counter image is a toss. Oh, I should have said, so the, the reason these spaces are called toric, there are several reasons to call these spaces toric. One is precisely the occurrence of these toes here. And another is that some people like uh, calling uh, this an algebraic torus. I don't, but... Uh, Why would someone do that? Uh, well, because the a torus is a, a product of, of uh, several copies of S1. The uh, Tn, the torus Tn, is uh, S1 to the n. And uh, okay, but from S1 to C star, uh, you can see why C star to the n is a bit analogous to a torus. Um, again, if, uh, instead of giving uh, general uh, definitions here, uh, let me tell you how this works. So then uh, in the case of CP1, for example, the counter image, so the, the map, so this is P. So there's a map from CP1 to P, and the counter image uh, of a point here will be a circle, uh, which is a torus. It is a one-dimensional torus. And the counter image of this other point is also another uh, circle. So the uh, here, this arrow is really the map that I'm drawing. So the map takes all this circle and uh, sends it, uh, maps it to this point. Uh, so, uh, so in this sense, the counter image is the circle. Here, uh, also, the, this other circle is mapped to this point. Another circle is mapped to this point here. The counter image of uh, the two endpoints of the segment are points. 
So when I said the counter image is a torus, I didn't tell you what dimension. And the, uh, the dimension can change. So here, generically, for a point inside the endpoint, the counter image is a, a circle. But for the twin points, the counter images have zero dimension torus, which is a point. If you put together all these circles with the two points at the end, I think you can visualize that now this is topologically a sphere. Of course, it, uh, here it doesn't look very round, but uh, uh, yeah, for that, uh, in this lecture, we won't consider much. Uh, uh, we won't, I won't tell you much about the matrix. That could be done uh, in this language. Um, but the, uh, here I want to focus more on the really topological properties. So uh, we see once again that we obtain a two sphere. The CP1 is a two sphere. How about CP2? We learned that the uh, polyhedron is uh, this triangle. And here, the counter image of uh, this point is a, a two dimensional torus, S1 times S1, which we usually draw in this fashion. Um, because the, this is a one S1 and this is the other. The counter image of a point on this side. Uh, for example, uh, let's say here, will be instead a circle. You can think of it this way. Uh, let's say, actually, if I'm drawing it like this, this circle. So you can think that the uh, torus, uh, just like in this case, the circle degenerated to a, a point here. And here, the uh, torus degenerates to, uh, you can think that this uh, torus is becoming thinner and thinner until it becomes just a circle. On the other hand, if you go towards this side, the, the other side will get thinner and thinner um, and you they degenerate to something like this. And here will degenerate in a diagonal fashion, let's say. What about the counter images of, uh, of the Vertices, well, these are points. Now, of course, it is uh, harder to uh, visualize in your head how all these uh, tori, circles, and points come together. You cannot uh, just do it because uh, here was a two-dimensional space, and here it is. Uh, you have a four-dimensional space. Uh, it might be problematic to visualize a four-dimensional space in your head, uh, but in a way. Uh, you know, this is giving you the best uh, possible uh, strategy. So the the triangle tells you the the real parts of the compass coordinates in a sense. It puts together the real parts of the compass coordinates, and then the uh, the these tori are the phases. The um, you know in a polar decomposition for Z for a compass coordinate Z. The, these e to the i phi's are circles, of course, and they put together, they give um, copies of tori. And this is why you have all this tori. And when people, um, probably most people, when uh, have in mind these stores, when they say that uh, 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 as a reason that uh, this set of spaces is called toric. Okay, uh, more examples. More examples can be obtained if you know a little more uh, about the uh, complex uh, geometry. Uh, in particular, you need the, the idea of blow up. I, once again, I'll uh, introduce this idea by uh, looking at an example 
um, a real, sorry, a real example, just like I did for the uh, real project space. I don't know if that was helpful, um, but um, let's try to do the same for uh, the concept of blob. So if you uh, are in um, R3, let's say, you might imagine, um, so the, let's say you have the origin, And you, the idea is that you want to define a new space that is not R3, but that takes into account uh, all the possible ways, directions um, by which you could approach the origin. This could be useful, for example, the origin of this idea is that uh, the, the, there are some cases where there are some functions where you have a uh, a derivative that depends on which uh, uh, direction you're taking it. So perhaps the old function is not really differentiable, but it's a uh, um, cliche differentiable. I mean, you can different, uh, the, the derivative exists only along uh, directions. Well, uh, so instead of having, then it means that if you want to, uh, instead of having a single point at the origin, you would like to have Something that takes into uh, keeps into account all the possible directions by which you uh, can approach. So instead of the origin, you want the space of lines. But the space of lines is exactly the projective space. Projective space we saw that in real in the real case is just a sphere basically. So instead of a point, You would define a new space. Uh, let me call it with the hat, with the hat, where you take the origin and you you inflate it into a sphere. So the origin is now gone, and instead of it, you have a sphere. Not in really a sphere, because I told you uh, it would be an R P two, the space of lines in R three, which is a sphere with the, its uh, opposite points identified. Uh, this is called the antipodal identification. So uh, instead of uh, saying inflate, uh, we say blow up. It's the same. Uh, it's another word in English that means the same. Okay, so that's the. Um, really, there is no. I denote it in this way. Now really, the, uh, this arrow maybe I should call it blow down because it goes from here to here. There is no map that goes the opposite way because that uh, this point would be associated to many points. So. To be more precise than this, we call the blow down. If we do this in uh, uh, the complex case, it is uh, more difficult to visualize it. But the idea is the same. You take CN and you replay, you define a new space. Where the origin is replaced by a copy of Uh, CP and minus one. Uh, let me give the formal uh, definition. So you take this is a 
the space of pairs. In, uh, where X is supposed to be in uh, CN and S, uh, sorry, X and S in CPN minus one. And you, uh, you don't just want a product. Uh, but you want the space, um, only the pairs, such that this property holds. Why? Well, um, if you just had the product, you would have that you have replaced every point of Cn by Cpn minus one, and you don't want that. With this equality, you see that if you have an X, which is different from the origin, uh, then this, uh, pop, uh, this um, relation here uniquely identifies, um, tells you what the S's are. And so it gives you identically one point of CPN minus one. So then you have replaced one point of uh, the original space of CN with one point. But if X is the origin, then this um, property here is uh, satisfied to any set uh, to any set of S's. So if X is uh, the origin, S can be anything in CPN minus one. And so you see that uh, instead of the origin, you have a copy of C CPN minus one. So this is the blow up. In torque geometry, um, now, I'm going to tell you directly the result. But really, this is an exercise. So remember that for C2, our polyhedron is, uh, in, uh, is infinite. It's not compact. We didn't uh, make it compact. But, uh, uh, having this other side and making it a triangle, it was just a C2. And what is the, the exercise is finding the polyhedron for the, um, for the block, or really checking what I'm about to tell you. Still non compact, but now uh, it looks like this. So you see, this is reasonable because the instead of the origin that you had here, you have a segment. The origin has been replaced by segment, but the segment represents, we know it, a CP1. This is exactly. Uh, what we say here in general. So you see that uh, uh, in the case n equals two, uh, the origin is replaced by copy of CP two minus one, so CP one. So this does exactly what uh, um, what it should. The exercise is checking it more carefully. How do you do it? You would have to define the two vector um, vectors at this. Remember, the, so this is the general rule. You define the basis of vectors here, the basis of vectors here. And then uh, you work out the linear relation between the two. And this should give you the the uh, so you should compare that to the transition functions for these spaces. In order to define the transition functions for these spaces, uh, you have to go to the two charts of uh, CP1 that we saw earlier. 
and uh, this uh, C2 you leave it uh, um, as it is. So in other words, there are two charts that are the type C2 times U0 and C2 times U1, where U0 and U1 are the charts that we saw in the introduction. So there is one then one transition function and it corresponds exactly to, to this uh, linear relation here. Okay, this would be the exercise. But I, uh, so this exercise is checking uh, this result, but then giving you, I'm telling you what the final result is. Incidentally, this works also in higher dimensions. Uh, I will do this with my hands. Uh, so if you have a C3, then you have a three dimensional octant in R3. This is uh, your polyhedron, it's a non compact polyhedron. And the, the blow up in this case corresponds in chopping this uh, uh, the origin, cutting it like this, and try to imagine if you cut diagonally, what uh, figure appears instead of the origin? A triangle. And indeed, the triangle is the toric polyhedron for um, a CP2. CP2 was the, exactly what was supposed to appear here at the origin, uh, in the case capital N equals three. So everything is good. Well, uh, using this exercise, we can provide um, uh, many more examples from our CP2. because I told you that you can do it at the origin, but you can do it at the origin of any complex space, really, not just of uh, CN. Uh, you can imagine chopping off, so cutting this vertex, doing the blow up here. And you obtain this, or maybe you can cut uh, this one here. You define a different block, uh, the two are really the same space because there's nothing different, of course. Uh, the origin of this chart and the origin of this chart are well, either the point towards uh, the homogeneous coordinate z0 z equal to zero, the one where z1 is equal to zero, but um, what's uh, so different about the two? Uh, so they, uh, these two are in the same space and they're called, uh, this is called dp1 del pezzo one. So the reason that um, this space uh, deserves a name um, would uh, to, uh, to give a full explanation would give us uh, take us to Parafield. Uh, let's say that there are some nice pro um, properties of uh, curvature. So basically, the curvature uh, this space is uh, both CP two and this the pezzo one are. Uh, um, have positive curvature in an appropriate sense. Um, this property keeps being true if you blow up a second time. So blow up. Uh, once again, blow up is if you go <laughs> opposite with respect to that. So maybe let's be consistent. And let's call this a blowdown. You end up with some pentagonal shape. 
And this is called the del pezzo two. And with respect to the original CP2, we have blow, uh, blown up two points. If you, uh, you can blow up also this vertex and you will obtain uh, what is called the del pezzo three and so on. Uh, you can blow up further, but uh, if you, uh, so as long as if you are blowing up three points, you can always, uh, even if you don't know, so if you give me a blow up at three points, I can always uh, arrange without uh, any real loss of, uh, singular, of uh, generality can make it so that there are the three vertices. However, the blow up at a, a random fourth, fourth point, so that would be called the, the pezzo tree and so on. But the, if I blow up at the fourth point, uh, it is not guaranteed that, I mean, the, the vertices are over. Of course, uh, I could blow up at this uh, for the points and so on, but this is uh, non generic. A generic blow up at four points of the CP2 will not be toric. Um, some special ones are, uh, will be toric. You can blow up. Uh, only find a number of types uh, of times before the um, uh, only eight times before the, um, the so that the space is uh, still um, of um, positive curvature. And this is the reason that these spaces are uh, have a name because they have been studied because of this positive curvature story. Uh, incidentally, one more thing I, I can say is that you see that this can, could also be produced from CP1 times CP1, which shows a square by blowing up this vertex. So you can get the del pezzo two more quickly in this fashion. Let me erase this because after all this, the pets of one, it is nothing new. Uh, this an intriguing, if you keep going here, like I said, there's uh, the pets of three. There's an intriguing paper uh, by Ah, okay, good. How long ago did the did the connection stop? Just like five seconds ago. Don't worry. No, I was wondering because at some point I said, "Oh, I shouldn't have mentioned this," and I thought maybe <laughs> by by coincidence it was exactly when the connection. So okay, good. Um. Wonderful. The uh, next topic is that of those questions. Yeah, I can nicely. So, haven't we seen already uh, Santore? Well, uh, this is now. A different type of um, so there are so many Torah in this story, but that let's uh, uh, not get confused. Okay, so there, there is another way uh, to produce uh, toric spaces as a quotient by C stars. This as uh, this is different from the C stars that we uh, had at the beginning. Perhaps I should have said it even then. So. We have this story that uh, the space contains a big chunk that is a C star 
to some power. So for our running example for the CP2, uh, the interior of this triangle represents a C star uh, squared. And then all the sides are copies uh, of other smaller dimensional uh, spaces that we glue together so that we make our space compact. Okay. You have probably noticed that there is another C star here, which is this. This has nothing to do with, uh, with that C star. It's another C star. So you start here uh, from a space that had a higher dimension. And in particular, in that higher dimension, there was another copy of C star. And now you portion it away. So there are lots of C stars here, but let's not confuse the ones that remain in our space with the ones that we have um, uh, modded out. And the topic of those quotients is uh, uh, the way uh, generalization of this. So far, CPN was defined in this fashion, but uh, for example, some other spaces like um, Let's take our del pezzo here, our last example. This guy here doesn't have that definition. So it has been ruined by this blow up. Is there a way to repair it? Yes. Um, because there is a more general way to produce toric spaces. Exactly in the same fashion, only. So in that case, we started from an n plus one Sorry, dimension case. Um, there is a question on the chat. It says, oh. blowing out never destroyed the smoothness of the original space. Very good. So I um, have uh, skipped uh, this comment. I um, I was hoping to get back to it at the, at the end. The smoothness, uh, I haven't commented on it, but uh, uh, basically it's almost the opposite. So the blow up has been, I told you one motivation, which was the derivatives of functions, but they really uh, for most um, people, for complex geometers, a blow up is a way to make a space less singular, not more. So blowing down can destroy your uh, smoothness, indeed. Blowing up makes things um, less singular. So I haven't told you that, and I was planning to um, get to it at the end. But the, you see, uh, at the the basis at one vertex was um, of um, integer vectors, uh, integer value vectors that go like this. And I told you that nothing changes if I apply SL to Z, uh, an SL to Z action. Um, but what that means is that they need, uh, the vectors are still a basis for uh, the lattice. For ZN, uh, if you take integer coefficients, uh, this was not very clear. Uh, I'm anticipating something that I intended to, to say later. But basically, there is a criterion. Uh, so I will get back to this criterion, but there is a criterion to make sure uh, th that tells you whether the, the space is smooth or not by just looking at what happens around the vertex. So once again, uh, so if you draw, so the vectors that I um, that I drew at, the, at each vertex were the, uh, the, the integer valued uh, vectors that um, uh, have, have um, start from that vertex and go along the sides. Now, uh, if they are a basis, of course they are a basis that, uh, uh, for example, in this case, two vectors for R2, they are um, a basis, but uh, it is not clear in general that if I draw two vectors, I don't know, if I draw two vectors in, uh, in R2, if they are like this, it is not clear, I mean, random, two va random vectors, or even if they are not random, but integer valued, let's say, within the integer coefficients. 
if they are, I don't know, 0, 3, and 2, 3, they will not generate all the lattice uh, because, for example, the point 0, 1 will not be in the span, in the integer span of these vectors. Uh, instead, if I have these vectors, of course, uh, any point now will be in the, uh, like uh, if this is zero one and this is one zero, then one one will be in the um, integer span of these vectors. So, um, any other point will be in the integer span of these vectors. So the criteria means then that the uh, the vectors that we have drawn uh, around the, the vertices uh, should be such that they span uh, z uh, square in this case or z n in the most in more general case. Uh, when you take integer coefficients. That, uh, so using that criterion, uh, we should be able to see that uh, the space is still smooth. Here, it was clear because it's exactly this base basis. But here, they are like this. So the two vectors are the form one, uh, 0, 1 and 1 minus 1. And it's easy to see that they still generate uh, that uh, Z2, when you take their um, integer combinations. So long story short, the space is still smooth. Not only that, but uh, when you blow up, you usually uh, get better uh, smoothness properties. And this is why one of the reasons that this uh, concept is uh, used. Thank you for that question. So uh, let's come back to our generalization. I, what I wanted to do here was to generalize the definition of CPN. CPN has been a prominent example of, uh, um, in during all the lecture, of uh, as I ramped up the air conditioning. <laughs> So uh, CPN has been a prominent example of toric uh, manifold uh, so far. So I want to see whether uh, we can extend it to a, we can extend that method also to other toric spaces for which it is not so clear that it holds. The general story is that you don't start from CN plus one, but for CN plus K. And you don't uh, just uh, take off the origin, but in general, you have to take off some more stuff. Uh, this is, uh, I'm calling this F, some excluded locus in CN plus K. Uh, so far, I'm not telling you what it is. And here I will mod out by C star to the K so that the uh, final dimension is indeed and kind of complex dimension is indeed n. How uh, do we produce such a, uh, an expression from a, from a toric space? Well, I told you that everything is summarized in, po in the polyhedron. So in, in principle, both F exclude the locus, uh, with the generalization of what used to be the origin for the, uh, for Compass budget space. And this uh, the way that this uh, C star to the K acts on this CN plus K should be uh, extracted from the uh, polyhedron. Why do I say that I need to tell you how this acts on this? Well, in the CPN case, if I told you how uh, the C star acted by multiplying all the uh, coordinates in the same way. Will it be the same here? Well, in general, it's more complicated. Let me. Uh, once again, I'll give you the algorithm. Um, first, I'll tell you more or less how, how it works, and then we. Um, we look at a couple of examples, not just uh, CP2. Oh, 
So first of all, um, we write down the some vectors that I will call dual vectors. We'll see what they are. And then uh, the sister action, sister to the K action is the kernel. Okay, this is the slogan, it's clear. I mean, this is not an explanation. So let's see what I mean. So first of all, what are the dual vectors? The dual vectors are uh, extracted from the polyhedron in this fashion. Again, I illustrate the procedure with, with an example. So what you do is, uh, you given a, uh, a side, or in general, uh, you would start from a higher dimensional phase if we are in a higher dimension. Uh, so for example, remember you had the tetrahedron for CP3. Well, you will look at that. You will start from the phase of the phases of the tetrahedron. And you consider the, uh, the vectors. So these dual vectors are the ones that are orthogonal to the phases and pointing inside. So the, consider this phase, we draw them somewhere else. So this is, uh, I will call it W0. Uh, uh, why? Well, we can think of this as the Remember there were uh, th the three charts uh, we were called the U0, U1, and U2. So I will use the same convention, at, at least in this case, for the three vectors. I will call them W0, W1, and W2. So here, for this phase, I will have uh, the orthogonalness along this direction. And for this phase, the orthogonal is along this direction. Okay. Also, these are integer valued. So, uh, the, I'm also drawing the lines um, generated by sort of the they prolong these uh, vectors, and these are called rays sometimes. The, the story does not end here because people also like to think about, uh, so in this sense, this, uh, these are the dual vectors, but they're also the, uh, people think also about the dual, uh, the duals to uh, various parts of this uh, polyhedron. So for example, uh, you can also consider what is the dual, to this vertex. Of course, uh, the, the, there is no sense in saying, oh, let me consider the vectors that are orthogonal to a point. No, that does not work. But you can, the story is that you should look at the, all the vectors uh, that are uh, who's, uh, such that the inner product with the, uh, with the vectors of the faces uh, is positive. So here, it will be all the vectors from here to here. So this phase here is dual to uh, this vertex. Let's call it vertex V0. This phase here, this is all in R2. Huh? Uh, so the, this drawing does not have a third dimension. It might look like it. So here, 
you are considering all the vectors that are between W0 and W2, basically. And this is so dual to the vertex V1. And this is the third side, the third part here is dual to uh, V2. And okay, so uh, when you, it's higher dimension, you will have um, a more complicated uh, setup. But uh, here, uh, you have decomposed R2 into a set of uh, various objects that are uh, called cones. <laughs> now, of course, a cone in, uh, the, um, back in school was a very particular geometrical figure. But uh, the point here is that we are considering uh, objects that are conical in the sense that they are invariant under rescaling. So we would uh, denote them by usually the, this is uh, called the, all this uh, part of the of R2 is called like this. All this part is called like this. Hopefully it's clear what I mean. Now, uh, what do I do with these? Uh, so this, the whole thing here is called the fan, Doric fan. Now I collect, so now I'll tell you how the sister, what the sister action is. So I need to tell you in this case, uh, how, so we know in this case already what the result is. Um, we know that this is a compass quadratic space. So there will be one C star acting on uh, three copies of C, C3. But how do you extract this from here? Well, you write the Ws and uh, in as a column. So the W0, W1, and W2, their components are, uh, well, sorry, let me put traditionally here in this example, we put here, we put first W1, W2, W0. It doesn't really matter. Uh, one zero, zero one, minus one, minus one. So, now, what do you do? What did I mean here, the kernel of them? Well, you need to take, uh, so this is a two by three matrix and you need to uh, complete it in a sense. You need to find a, a three dimensional vector that is orthogonal to these two three dimensional vectors. So you now consider, take this matrix and you kind of turn it around. You don't consider it anymore as three, uh, two-dimensional vectors, but there's two three-dimensional vectors. And you look for the three-vector. In this case, there's only one, but in general, there will be more than one. Orthogonal to the rows. In this case, uh, there's only one vector that is orthogonal to them, and it looks like this, one, one, one. If you take the inner part that one, one, one with the one, zero, minus one, you will get one plus zero plus minus one equals zero, and same here. So it is indeed orthogonal. Okay, now this gives you the action. Uh, in this example, we knew it. Uh, we knew it already that Z uh, not Z one Z two was identified with lambda Z one Z not lambda Z one lambda Z two, and this is uh, these are the, the in general the lambda would act with powers. Here, the powers are all one because all the entries here are all one. Uh, this example is a bit trivial because we know the answer already, but uh, let me look at the less trivial example, which is uh, the 
VP1. So in this case, uh, we have one more vector because we not, not only have this, this, and this, but we also have this one because it's of the orthogonal to the new phase that has been introduced by the blow up. And the, if you put together, uh, so before we had uh, the ones, so these are the three that we had previously, and now we have one more, uh, which is just zero minus one. It goes backwards, it goes uh, down. So now there will be uh, two. So look, now we look for the, for the uh, four dimensional vectors orthogonal to the rows. And there are, there is the previous one with a zero because after all, the computation is the same as what we were doing earlier. One, one, one was orthogonal to this. So now it would be, if I put a zero here, I will still be orthogonal I and mean, the computation is the same. But now there is one more. Uh, let's see if it works. Uh, no, what am I doing? Uh, zero, zero, one. You see that zero, one, zero, one is orthogonal to this trivially because there are only zeros here and also orthogonal to the second. Okay, so now we have that the action is, so first of all, we start with the C, or not with C3. There will be an excluded locus. I will tell you in a second what it is. And the action, the sister action is this, there will be two identifications. So one is corresponding to the first row. So the powers will be uh, of lambda are the numbers in this matrix. But there's a second identification. Let me now introduce a second parameter called a mean, also in C star. And the powers are, okay, mu to the zero, nothing. Mu to the one, mu to the zero, mu to the one. So this, uh, we are defining the space with this identification law. This is the so-called charge matrix. That's what the people call this C, also in this case. The uh, excluded locus is um, it can also be extracted with this um, um, from from this algorithm. So a, a given locus. So. For F um, what do we say? So 
suppose you have a set of uh, where the various uh, coordinates are set to zero of various of these homogeneous coordinates set, uh, are set to zero. Well, this is in the pseudo de locus. If If the phase is uh, corresponding to setting to zero this one or to setting to zero this one and so on, have zero intersect. Let's see what this means. So here, uh, for example, Z not equals zero corresponds to this phase. Z one equals zero corresponds to this case, and Z two equals zero corresponds to this case uh, to this phase. And the You see that the corresponding in the fan this corresponding uh, well no the, you can see it directly here these three have uh, no common intersection these three faces so according to this general definition here that zero plus one uh, that uh, the locus where all three are zero is part of the excluded locus. We know this already. It's the origin. Here, what is the excluded locus? Well, uh, this was the not equal zero, z one equal zero, z two equal zero. And this is the, the set where the new coordinate is uh, set equal to zero. But we see that Z1 and Z3 and Z0 and Z2. So the locus where Z1 and Z3 are um, zero is part of the excluded, simultaneously zero is part of the excluded locus because they, the two faces don't meet. That's um, what the criterion is saying. So in this case, F is. This union with z1 equals z3 equals zero. Uh, yeah. This is the, the recipe. Uh, oh my god, I was slower than anticipated with time. Singularities, let me tell you what is this. This is fun. Why do we care about singularities? In string theory, we care a lot because they have some interesting physics associated with them. Some in uh, other theories, uh, we don't uh, typically appreciate singularities because um, uh, it's not clear that the physical theory makes sense on them. But uh, on many uh, string theory is peculiar in that it makes it still makes sense on many singularities, uh, even if they are singular. So one example that uh, uh, I, I need to okay, we have five minutes, but I need to tell you this is the conifold. The conifold singularity is um, uh, very simple. So it is described by um, we can describe it, for example, um, with this 
uh, method of um, th those quotients. So by starting with a polyhedon, so we start with a polyhedon that is, uh, so that they're given, I need to be in high dimensions now. So the, um, the drawing is uh, uh, not as easy. Uh, this is basically a, a, a pyramid. Uh, the drawing is something like this. So you should imagine a pyramid with a um, uh, space is a square, but that keeps going <laughs> forever because this is a non-compact space. But um, this is maybe hard to imagine. Uh, I'm giving you directly the C, the charge matrix. And uh, well, I can also give you the Ws. Um, remember the columns of this matrix that, are, that I'm about to write are the four three-dimensional vectors. And now, these three-dimensional vectors are orthog the orthogonals to the faces of this uh, of this P, because there are four non-compact faces and they have four uh, vectors that are orthogonal to them. Uh, drawing it uh, is less convenient. On the book, I have done it uh, with the help of um, a computer and it looks better, but uh, even there, it, uh, it's a bit of a challenge. But uh, um, these are the Ws. And the, you can see that the C is orthogonal to all the rows. So this is the charge matrix. And consequently, the space is of the type, exactly of the type of uh, torus quotient that we had. With this identification. Well, now we, there is no relation to uh, any CP, any complex quadratic space, so we can start from one. And now you see that the identification is. Because these are the exponents of lambda and this identification, one, one, minus one, minus one. Uh, uh, okay, I am glad to go on, but uh, you know, please shoot me down with, <laughs> when you feel that uh, people no longer <laughs> can no longer take it. Um, so good. Let me, I was about to say what the app, uh, is the excluded locus. Let me try to make a better. So I draw this as a guide to the eye. So maybe this is better now. Uh, let me exchange the whole of the two. Hmm. I think this is more clearly visible than the previous one. The square has no particular role, it's just to guide the eye. So you see from here that these four faces um, have, uh, so they all intersect at the, um, at the origin, but the two opposite ones don't intersect. So. It 
It's uh, just like the previous case. Because that if you say that uh, these two phases are corresponding to Z1 equals zero and Z3 equals zero, and this to Z2 equals zero, Z4 equals zero, you see that they never intersected uh, except at the origin. Okay, so. Uh, no, wait a second. What am I saying? Um, I jumped ahead, sorry, but this was the, so this uh, intersect at the origin, so it's still fine. Uh, uh, here, we don't want to keep away all this because they do intersect at the origin, so this is what I meant to write. They all, um, Since they all intersect the origin, it is the sorry, it is the empty set. Nothing excluded. When we start uh, excluding stuff, uh, so there is a trick to start excluding stuff so that we make it uh, non-singular. By the way, how do we see that this is singular? I told you before that the um, at the point you should draw the three. Uh, vectors, uh, blah, blah. I mean, the vectors that span. But here you see, actually, the, there are four vectors already at this vertex. So the criterion uh, isn't met uh, already because we, we don't have three vectors uh, as we normally would have, but four. So this is indeed the singularity. Uh, perhaps I can tell you also um, why, um, why it is so popular uh, since you gave me some a few more minutes. So um, there is um, a way to, so, so this is our space, we call it conifold. And we map, there is a way to map it to C4. Why do I map it to C4? Well, you'll see in a second. So first of all, so the map is not supposed to take all of C4 because this is a three-dimensional space. The dimension is, well, you can see it from the fact that our polyhedron is a three-dimension, but also because we have dimension four minus one. So why do I map it to C4? Well, let me do it. So what is the map? Uh, C4 has coordinates x1, x2, x3, x4. And I give you the map in this fashion. Z1, Z3 is X1. Uh, let's do Z2, Z1, Z4. Z2, Z3. And Z2, Z4. The logic is the following. Look at the identifications. These quadratic uh, objects I have um, discussed, I have written down, are precisely those uh, the, that are uh, the monomials that are invariant under this identification. So if I uh, Z1, Z3, so in Z1 associated to a point is not well defined because it, I can multiply it uh, by, by lambda, but the product of Z1, Z3 is invariant under this identification. So this map is well defined. Even if Z1 and Z3 are separate arms, uh, 
Z1 tensor trees. So Z1, Z4, the same, the blah, blah. So these are all well-defined. So this is a well-defined uh, map, a non-ambiguous map, an actual map from Chronicle to C4. Uh, but how can it be that I define the map to um, four dimension space? If uh, the main, uh, this is uh, three dimension, uh, the original space is three dimension. Well, it's because uh, really the image it's not all of C4, but uh, it is the locus where x1 times x3 is equal to x2 times x4. So uh, in other words, we well, the, the map is one to one. So they really the, uh, telling you that the image, so this locus in C4 is the same as your conifold. So this is another way of describing the conifold as a quadratic, uh, the zero of a quadratic function in C4. Why is this so popular? Well, this is the first, um, so the, first of all, uh, I have uh, this is a particular quadratic function, but uh, by changing coordinates in C4, you can reduce any quadratic, uh, any um, non degenerate uh, quadratic form uh, to this one. And uh, the thing is, uh, so in, um, in, um, in the study of loci of zero locus, uh, zero loci uh, of um, holomorphic functions. You find that uh, such a locus is uh, singular if it starts with uh, if it doesn't contain any linear term, basically. So if there was here x1 plus x1, x3, x2, x4, uh, then it wouldn't be, then this wouldn't be a singularity. Uh, so th then the quadratic singularity is the simplest type of singularity. The more, uh, so, uh, the higher the powers in your um, equation, the worse the singularity. So in this sense, this is the simplest singularity, the simplest three-dimensional singularity you can possibly imagine. This is why the economy for this so uh, popular. And it just so happens that it is also toric. We have defined it. Uh, originally with this uh, torus quotient associated to a polyhedron. General facts. I notice here that this, uh, the equation is uh, of this form. The equations will of uh, whenever you do this procedure to a toric singularity will always have a an equation of this type monomial one equals uh, monomial two just like here we have monomial one equals monomial two if you we had monomial uh, one equals monomial two plus monomial three then it wouldn't be toric this is your um, this is a useful criterion. Okay, so the, um, the uh, before I was getting confused because I was running ahead to uh, one more thing I want to say, which is how you desingularize. So sometimes it's useful to. So okay, first of all, uh, in uh, um, I'm mixing this given time with uh, the last part of applications. So this conifold is the simplest type of singularity, and in string theory we like um, also putting it on singularities. And this conifold was the first case where it was demonstrated that the uh, string theory still makes sense on this space, even though uh, it is singular. The way you do this is because the, uh, there is a way to um, describe um, the uh, so string theory. Uh, one of the definitions of the string theory is via the wall sheet action. And there's a way, so the, the wall sheet action is the famous uh, uh, sigma model. But there's a simple way to uh, describe the sigma model for toric spaces. It is particularly nice. Uh, the, um, 
the string theory action. Uh, it, it would take a long time to uh, to work it out, but that uh, there is a simple way. There's a particularly nice uh, fashion to describe a string theory ontoric uh, spaces. The uh, any particular uh, on this carnival, even though it is singular, uh, because of what I just said, uh, the um, physics of string theory still makes sense. In spite of this, sometimes we like uh, modifying the space a little bit so that it becomes um, non singular. And uh, I will tell you this, and with this, I, can, I think I can conclude and open to open up to questions if there are any. So you have many options. So the, the first thing you might imagine doing is the blot. Now the blot we saw earlier corresponds to chopping your space. Why then? So there was this question at some point, uh, uh, oh, uh, how does the blot modify the singularity properties? And I told you that it goes the other way, blowing up makes it better. So believe me, if I chop this thing off, uh, now I will get, well, you can imagine that uh, I get the same picture. Let me try to make it here. But with, uh, where now the space really starts with this square. Okay, this didn't succeed. So let me try from scratch. So this time, the the origin got replaced not by copy of um, CPN, but by this square, what is a square associated to? CP1 and CP1. Why uh, did this happen? Well, uh, because we, we have blown up a uh, singularity. So we are not guaranteed. So before we were blowing up a, uh, a normal point, a non-singular point. But there is a better I mean uh, an alternative way, which is called the small resolution. What is so here if you blow uh, a block, you introduce a, a further element, a further w, a further dual vector. And so you have to change everything. You have to change um, the chart matrix also. But in this small resolution, I'll try to draw this. You keep the same Ws. And yet, so that's what it is. You split the origin and you make it into a CP1. Because now there's a segment that, uh, the, instead of uh, replacing the origin. So, the same WI and, and the chart matrix As for the conifold. But now F 
is, and sorry, this is why I got confused before. Now we have an excluded locus because uh, this space and this space, these two opposite faces, really never meet, not even at the, at the origin. And so uh, say that this is at one equals zero and this is at three equals zero, you will have. You can also do the same with Z2 and Z4. There's another small resolution where you, uh, you make those two not intersect. And this is called the small resolution. So you uh, introduce a CP1 at the, at the origin. Finally, uh, so these two are toric. Uh, finally, uh, you could uh, forget, so you could start from this, uh, on this quadratic um, equation. And you deform it. Before it was x1, x3 minus x2, x4. equals zero, but now you say that it's equal to mu, some number. It turns out uh, that this is non-toric, so it goes outside, so still in C4. So it's outside uh, our topic, uh, but it's uh, very commonly considered. Um, it turns out that here the origin has been replaced not by a copy of CP1, by a copy of three sphere. This uh, can be obtained by some other methods in algebra geometry, in which um, topic for another feature. Okay, so I think I'll uh, stop here. Thanks.